Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We will do away with the usual formalities because I'm sure you didn't come here to listen to me. But I did want to inform those of you who are here that this is part of the Holocaust series, the Holocaust lecture series, which have been going on here. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you. This is part of the Holocaust lecture series, which have been going on at this university for six years. Uh, each year, the theme of the Holocaust, of course, is different. This year, we are discussing the aftermath of the Holocaust, and our most celebrated speaker is Dr. Bruno Bettelheim. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Huh? All right? Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be permitted to talk to you about a theme that I'm sure is important to all of us. The after effects of the Holocaust get quite clear. It remains to be seen what they will be, but it seems that they extend to this, not only to the second, but to the third generation. Is that better? Maybe we can move the chair a little closer. Is that better? Yes. All right. Excuse me, there's one, there's one additional thing we need to do. Thank you. Well, are we ready to begin? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I say, as I said, it's a distinct pleasure and an honor to permit me to talk to you about a theme that is very close to my heart and to my interests. Aftermath of the Holocaust are hard to assess at this moment because it seems to go into the third generation. Certainly the second generation is in, in, impacted by it, and the third generation. I want to particularly talk about the children of, uh, the, of the children who survived the Holocaust. As you know, some who survived it then committed suicide. The most famous of them are Gina Marie, the French writer, Paul Celine, the great German poet, and Primo Levi, who took his life just a relatively short time ago. Primo Levi is particularly interesting because he tried everything he could to cope with the experience of the concentration camp. He wrote books on it, and Paul Celan tried to relieve himself of the experience that lost his parents, his family in concentration camps. He himself was in a labor camp, in a work camp. And he, he wrote probably the most famous poem about the concentration camp, Death Fugue, and many other poems dealing with con problems of the constant M, but it didn't work. It didn't work as well as he hoped, because as I said, he committed suicide. But not only that, he violently attacked his own wife, who had to be protected against him, because in a obviously paranoid, it, he tried to went after her with a knife. These are just three famous survivors, but there are many more who are not famous, whose name I could tell you, but it wouldn't mean anything to you, who managed to survive for many years, but finally couldn't make it. Now, why is it so? I think the answer to it, the best answer to it, has Primo Levi given. He spoke about that when he was liberated, when he was in the camp, 
expect that once he's liberated, he'll be so happy, gloriously happy. But actually, his experience on liberation was the opposite. It was a feeling of shame and a feeling of guilt that pervaded his life, obviously up to his death. Now, I particularly was taken by that because it was to my own experience. When I was liberated from Buchenwald, I also, right in the time, I expected that I would be very happy and happy the rest of my life for having escaped. But the experience I felt was exactly what Primo Levi describes, shame and guilt. Now, guilt is a better able to understand because so many people who were equal, my equal or my betters, did not survive. So one has a guilt feeling that one was the lucky one who survived this terrible ordeal. But why shame? It's harder to explain, and Primo Levo doesn't explain it either. But I believe the shame comes from the utter degradation to which one had to submit oneself in order to live and to survive. Although that was inescapable and utter necessity, the fact is that it was shameful. It was shameful to suffer such degradation without fighting back. Now, that, uh, that, that be my introductory remarks. Now, I would like, if you don't mind, to, to read to you a lengthy paper that I've written as an introduction, really, to a book of a child survivor, Claudine Well. And the title of the book is Les Dépadres au Revoir. I did not say goodbye to them. And she gave this title because when her parents came to say goodbye to her, because she was taken in in the home of a French Catholic lady as her own child, so that she would be saved from dying in the Holocaust. And her parents came the last time to say goodbye to her. And she couldn't say goodbye to them, and she hurried them on to leave. Now, why would she hurry them on? Why didn't she try to sp spend every moment with them as long as she could? She is not quite clear why she did it. But I think the reason is because by just saying a casual goodbye, she could maintain to herself that this was just a temporary goodbye and not a permanent separation. So this she hurry up that she would be able to let them go which was necessary for her to survive. So that's the book, title of the book, I did not say goodbye to them. And please do not hesitate to interrupt me with any questions you may have. I'd be happy to interrupt my reading of this paper to answer your questions which you may have. The terms of the children were forced to endure the unendurable. The agony is mute. With all the strength available to them, they need to bury in the deepest of their souls a wound, an anguish which never leaves them, a sorrow so cruel that it defies all expression. And this remains true for a lifetime, not only during the destructive events. The time immediately following them and also childhood and we all have a hard time to put things into words and to be able to give words to our resentments, to our deep concerns, and to our fears. Such an injury hurts so much and is so omnipresent, so vast, that it seems impossible to talk about it, even when a whole lifetime has passed since it was inflicted on the victim. For those who continue to suffer from it, something that happened in the past, the hurt is as present, as real many years later as it was on the day it happened. Despite all odd appearance to the contrary, it is not possible for these victims of past events to have normal lives in the present. Of the 75,721 Jews 
who were deported from France to 42 to 45, we had a 3% return. A pitiful small number of children survived the German occupation of France by being taken in and treated as their own child by some French families who were being otherwise hidden. Claudine Weig was one of these very few who was child as French couple in the unoccupied zone claimed as their own child. She describes something of this experience in her book, which consists mainly of her conversations with 17 other men and women who, like her, had survived through being separated abruptly from their parents. She describes first how the book came about. She became deeply upset during the bar mitzvah ceremony, so much so that she subsequently discarded the research she had begun and planned to submit to the authorities to be certified as a psychiatrist. Instead, she decided that she must lift the curtain, which for more than 35 years had hidden her own past, that of other Jewish children who, like her, had survived the deportation during the Hitler years in France. She tried to discover what the experience had been and what it had done to them and to her, and why, and where what miracles they had survived. Claudine Weck begins her deeply moving account of her own history and her account of others with similar stories with her experience by participating in a ceremony which, in all conditions, would have been one of rejoicing, the bar mitzvah of a friend of her daughter. But instead of the pride, the happiness which one would expect in, to feel a mother as she attended this religious ceremony which celebrates her son's becoming an adult, the mother of this boy withdrew into herself, covered her face, and began to cry at the height of the ceremony. Another one of those attending was upset by this distress, the happy occasion, and remarked about the Claudine Weg. This led her to remember the feelings she had experienced when her own son, a year earlier, had been with my mitzvah. She also had experienced great distress at the time, rather in great happiness. All this made her keenly aware that the moments which normally provide greatest happiness in life do not do so for those who have been grievously emotionally mutilated in their childhood. For them, their emotions are entirely different from those which one would view as normal. So she made the decision to abandon a psychiatric dissertation on which she had done already a great deal of work. Instead, she decided to embark on a very different investigation, which was much more significant. To hide the nature of the particular prison through which the word appeared to her and to, as to other survivors. Her decision made ex excellent sense for a person who is preparing herself to become a psychiatrist. To be able to help others with their difficulties in coping with life, the psychiatrist must understand what has made the patients the person that they are. More important, psychiatrists must know how they themselves became what they are, in what respect they experience things differently from those they are planning to treat. This is a good reason for exploring not only one's own history, but also that of those others who have suffered as oneself has. But the results of Claudine Weck's research are of much greater significance than the normal psychiatric dissertation, because it deals with what happened to the children who survived the, the Holocaust. So the questions she conducted with those who, as children, have suffered as she had, Claudine Weck has experienced one of the greatest tragedies of our time and the permanent consequences it had for the victims. She felt the need to examine how these victims had managed to survive, at least in some fashion, and was probably also motivated by the hope that her research could help her to free herself of the terrible burden of her past. She felt also, maybe unconsciously, that if others who had suffered like her could share their burden, maybe she could, she could do the same, once she understood what she was involved.
We, as readers, owe her appreciation for the courage with which she undertook a most difficult and most painful task that opens up a window on our understanding of the problem of sur survival. Her research sheds light on ideals that demand recognition, which must be understood in their magnitude and with due compassion. We want to live in peace with ourselves. Whether in close touch or from a great distance, we also live in a world of roundups, of deportations, of the concentration and extermination camps. We are part of this world of suffering children, however far we remove from it in distance and in time. What happened there and to the victims has left its imprint on all of us and on the world in which we live. Why were the young victims unable to speak about what happened to them? Why is it even some 20 or 30 years after it has all happened to them so very difficult to talk about what have happened to them during their childhood? And why is it, nevertheless, so important to talk about it for them and for I believe these questions are closely related to each other. Because what one cannot or wishes not to talk about, this one also cannot put to rest, cannot come to terms with. But this we must try to do, however hard and painful this may turn out to be, if these ancient wounds are not taken care of. They will continue to fester from generation to generation. As one of the men whose interview with Raphael said. The world must know that these deportations of their parents and of themselves had marked us into the third generation. It is too horrible. If there should be any doubt about whether these old, old horrors continue to mark the following generation, Helen Epstein, <laughs> an American's book, Children of the Holocaust, published in 79, United States, dispels it. Her parents were survivors of the extermination camps. The fate of her parents, their inability to speak about it, had severely damaged her life. And this also, she was born and raised in the safety of the United States. Very different from those whom Claudine Weck interviewed she was never torn away from her parents, never had to hide herself and to de deny who she was and what her background was to save her life, as we had been true for those whose stories Claudine Beck's books talks about. On the contrary, Helen Epstein's parents made the most strenuous efforts to shield their child from knowing and suffering from their past. Despite their efforts, however, the daughter did suffer from her parents' burden, from the fact of how much they had suffered without ever speaking to her about it. Growing up, Mrs. Epstein wished to find out whether their fate was unique or whether it was similar to that of other children who had parents of similar backgrounds. She sought them out and it used them to talk, not very different from the way Claudine Weck did. Like Helen Epstein herself, those whom she interviewed had been raised in physical security. Nevertheless, she found them all oppressed by the fate of their parents. Different as their histories were, they all had suffered from their parents' inability to talk about their friends' ordeals, and there was the consequences she had for them. Helen Epstein describes the experience of what she suffered by means of a moving image. That of for forging an iron box, which she painfully buried deep within herself, a box which made life most difficult and painful for her. For years, she writes, and I quote, my misery lay in an iron box, buried so deep inside of me that I was never sure just what it was. I knew it carried things more secret than sex and more dangerous than any shadow of a ghost. Because ghosts have shape and name. <coughs> what I had my iron box has none. 
Whatever lived inside me is so potent that words crumble before I they could describe it. It is this incapacity to name and to describe for the precious one so fiercely that forces one to bury these things so deeply within oneself that one can no longer reach them. Things thus repressed so deeply nevertheless seem to have been independent of the person that corrodes their life, destroys the right to enjoy anything, gives the feeling that one has the right to live. As Jean, one whom Claudine Beck interviewed, say, asked, why can't I take advantage of life? He expresses his fear that encased in this iron box might be feelings of violence. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Feelings of violence, the consequence of what we've done to him. He said, you know, I feel the violence I sometimes feel. Well up in me, it will rise up in me. It feels as if I would be in revolt against life itself. And what is most bizarre, I feel I have no right to live. Saul Friedlander's parents had entrusted him, the only son, to a French Catholic lady. To save him, she had him baptized, and for greater safety, educated him in a Jesuit school. He felt so much a, a Catholic that he intended to become a Jesuit priest. But at the moment he was about to enter the seminary, his aunt was revealed to him, and the fact that his parents had died in Auschwitz. From this moment on, his life was a most difficult struggle with his fate, as he movingly describes in his book, When Memory Comes. Eventually, he found his way back to his Jewishness. Although he's now happily married, has children, and is well established as a professor of history at both Tel Aviv University and at the University of California in Los Angeles, he continues to suffer. Suffer from an inner hurt, which he describes similarly to the way Helen Epstein did. He writes, and I quote, and now preserve the depths of myself certain disparate, incomprehensible fragments of existence, like those shirts of steel that survivors of great battles carry in their body. He also writes, and I quote, it took a deal of time to find the way back to my past. I could not trace the memory of the events themselves. But when I tried to speak about them, or to take a pen to describe them, I found myself immediately strangely paralyzed. Now what is the cause of this paralysis? Why did those whom Claudine Beck interviewed, as she herself had, erect a ball of silence as soon as they the lose of their parents? It is unwillingness, or more likely, an inability to talk about it which Claudine Beck dramatically, dramatically describes. As a lady who rescued her, urged her own parents to separate themselves from their child and go into hiding to save themselves, and they hesitated to leave her, their only child, Claudine urged them on her sick leave, I'll stay here. It was probably the pain of not having part of having not having parted from them in a better way, which made her give the book the title I did not say goodbye to them. I believe Claudine's urging her parents not on to leave her quickly was to only in small part to her fear that just for their safety. It's more likely that the little girl should not have accepted remaining with her new parents if she let herself think that she see her parents again. If she thought that she might lose them, lose them forever, she would have tried at all costs to remain with them. He could not have separated for them. 
So she hurried their departure to shorten a separation which would otherwise completely destroy her. Had she permitted herself the time to give words to her feelings, the time to say goodbye to her parents, she could not have let herself visit from them forever. By hurrying them on to leave, she prevented herself from having the time to think and to feel about what happened to her. She could separate herself from them only by pretending <coughs> that it was a short separation, and perhaps strictly a temporary one. When after the liberation, Claudine's mother returned to her, and Claudine was told that her father had died in the camps, the reaction was equally prompt and decisive. As soon as she met her mother, without shedding so much as a tear, she told her, I know, I have at least one parent left. Let's never talk about it. And for 20 years, she remained unable to speak about her father's death, even to her mother, or about the camps. Nor did she permit any reference made to her father her childhood. Hers was not a unique response to what had happened to her. On the contrary, it seemed to have been the typical reaction of children who had lost their parents in the Holocaust. It was a strange world, she writes, the world of the children who had lost their parents. Those she met, still as a child, after the liberation in a camp for such children in France, never spoke of their parents, their family, their past, or their homes. Quote, never to talk about these matters was a rule nobody had ever imposed on us. To speak about their unhappiness, their sorrows, to shed tears about it were thought by them, and also by me, and completely unacceptable. Why did they engage in such total repression of their feelings? Why did they engage on such denial of the facts which are all so evident, and of the extreme to them, where the consequences were obvious, the most significant aspects of their lives? What has been done in their childhood to those who finally, thanks to Claudine Weck's efforts, were able to speak about it, had so destroyed them, ruined their very existence, that they just were not able to talk about it even to those closest to them, even to those who have experienced the same as they have experienced. If some of them have said, quote, I've never thought it, not even with my wife, least of all with my mother. There are a number of reasons why they cannot, they do not wish to talk about it. It's not that they want to avoid thinking about what had happened, because they have never for a moment been able to forget it. They've been so obsessed by it all, all their lives, that it was too powerful an experience to talk about it. One reason that those who were interviewed were so reluctant to speak is because they were convinced that no words were adequate to express what had happened to them. No words could put it to rest. A deeper reason for their repugnance to speak about themselves is that they really realize, or at least think, that others which wish that they would not make their, could make their peace with what had happened to them. That those who, that their husband wanted to, them to be able to make peace with what happened, but they cannot do it. It's impossible. So those who listen may think they understand the tortures the victims had suffered, but the victim knows at best, they can comprehend only the facts, having no real comprehension of the nature of their sufferings. What good would he do then do to speak about it? This is why they could open themselves only to a person like Claudine Weck, who has suffered exactly as they have. They began to believe that they may be understood by her, and they realized that she has suffered more or less the same as we they may have. Those who haven't suffered as they had on, they do not believe can understand it. That's why they don't talk about it. If 
but even if study makes it could speak tongue at first with the greatest reluctance. The feelings which have enormous lust has left them are overwhelming to these victims that they threaten to engulf them, to destroy the walls which have erected against these terrible memories. So they not, might not be at all times be inundated by them. They had to construct such walls to be able to undertake the difficult task of creating a life after their devastation has ended. It required a strenuous effort to go on, with at best very small results. Therefore, they do not wish to see their violence threatened by talking about them. In order to be able to construct for themselves a best, a best care, yes, modus vivendi, the victims hit their true feelings so deeply in their innermost layers of their very being that they could hardly could reach them any longer. Not even they themselves could reach the depths of their feelings. They did this in order to be able to continue to live, to do well in school, to pass exams, to prepare for a profession, and later to be able to marry, to have children, to try to meet the obligation of family life. So the feelings are completely repressed, out of utter despair. So completely that all they know is how extremely difficult this is for them, and that in the deepest sense, their life is empty. As Colette, one of the interviewed, felt the inner emptiness so keenly that she tried to escape it by all means. So she's asking herself what sense it made for her to wish and it led to such terrible sufferings. Particularly since her husband was not Jewish, and the four children were brought up without any religion. She said, and I quote, I have the impression that I have struggled so much all my life, and now I have lost all the meaning of this struggle. <coughs> There's a vast emptiness to fill. She sums it all up by saying, quote, it's really very difficult to live. Yes, extremely difficult, unquote. All whom Claudine Weck could induce to talk about their past, their present feelings about it, knew that the speakers of this past would imply reawakening feelings so difficult to bear. This is why they dreaded the interview. Sonia, one of them, told her that she panicked at the thought of what it might do to her. She too feared, feared the emptiness which she experienced. She said, I quote, I have the impression of an emptiness of my childhood, an emptiness which troubles me deeply. Paulette, another survivor, began the conversation by saying, you know, although I agree to this conversation, I'm very anxious about it. I have tremendous anxiety about it. And this some 35 years after the events took place, which I'd like to recall. One might expect that after they, these, all these years have passed, with which they have lived, which look, looked like a normal life, to which they arrived with the maturity, with a place for themselves in society, created a home, had children, that they would have been healed over these ancient wounds. But for them, they are not ancient wounds, long scarred over. On the contrary, these wounds have never been healed, and as such as them, they begin to bleed anew, and profusely so. Now, at other times, and to other cat catastrophic events, children have also lost their parents. It can and does happen even today, to the earthquakes, to floods, or famines, or wars. These children suffer cruelly, by no means incapable of expressing their feelings, speaking of their parents or their terrible loss. In short, these children can grieve, can cry openly. By doing so, they can slowly come to terms with their fate. In consequence, they do not come to think that the death of their parents had deprived them of their own life, their right to live. 
The tragedy of those of whom Claudine Wegg speaks is that their fate had prevented them from grieving for their parents, from mourning for them. And this is why the old wounds cannot heal. At first, these children hoped their parents would return, as a few did indeed do. They hung on to this hope as long as they could. Some reports that these or she, her brother made a single, asked a single question about their parents, or why they had been made to change schools or religion. In order to hang on to their hopes that their parents might return, they couldn't talk about the subject. The reason she and her brother never talked about it, even with each other or with anybody else, was, as she put it, because we always waited and hoped, unquote. Similarly, Claudine Beck, like the others, never made any allusion for over 20 years. I believe the most powerful reason for this is the silence is that the unconscious never give up the hope that the absent parent was not really lost and that through some miracle would return. Any suggestion that even the unconscious is connected between not speaking father and is keeping my life in his inner self. As one of them quote, and I quote, I never speak about my father and with no one, because he lives, he lives in me, me. that's all, that is sufficient. For the same reason Robert continued to believe for years in the return of his parents, continues in his unconscious to believe that he still lives with them, so much so that, quote, I do not know what it means to live, to mean to live in the present. I live in the past. All my life is in the past. My real life is in the past, at a time when my parents were still alive. Even under normal circumstances, it is difficult to give up hoping for the return of a parent who had suddenly disappeared without a trace. No irrefutable proof of death has been found. Those who loved the missing person will not accept that they had died. Especially for a child, the wish to believe that the missing person is still alive is so strong that some proof is needed before the unhappy fact will be accepted. This holds true for normal circumstances and the condition in which these children existed were far from normal. Yet, if these so terrible in victimized children cannot admit that their parents have died or make their peace with this idea, even after many years, this is not only because it's so difficult to give up hope one has cherished for so long. There are more complex reasons for it. After such a loss, in order to be able to face life again, must have mourned the loss. Mourning, as Freud has shown, is a very difficult psychological process, but absolutely necessary if one is to overcome the depression if one has been projected by the loss. Mourning requires that for some time one concentrates single-mindedly on this task, devote all one's psychic energy for days or months or years. The ceremony of the funeral helps, and the various customs which have developed for coping with the death of a beloved person. Among the Jews, there's the custom of sitting Shiva. Among the Irish, there's the wake, and there are memorial services and masses for the dead. These customs permit the mourner to slowly accept the loss, at least to some degree, and slowly return, despite the depression caused by the loss. The task of mourning is facilitated when we can prepare ourselves in some measure for the loss. When the loved parent suffers a period of sickness before dying, or care for the sick parent during this time 
helps us to prepare for the loss, permits us to prepare ourselves emotionally for what is to come, to separate ourselves as we take devoted care of him. Even when this is not possible, usually we can at least say goodbye to the body, particularly in the burial and in the funeral rites. All these helps us to understand, little as we are ready to do so, that this person has really died. That is a fact that we must accept. Even with all these rituals, it's necessarily impossible to accept the death of a beloved and to retire without the help of others. What we need most is the help and support of these closest to us, usually the members of our own family. We need their physical presence and their direct participation in our own mourning. It is their presence and the comfort they offer which enables us finally to believe that not all is lost, that there are people left who wish us to help us, to continue with life. It is not the dead who need to be for people to pay their respects. It is the survivor who needs this. This is why since the most ancient times, funeral rites are amongst the most elaborate of all religious rites. So there are many reasons why the children whose parents disappeared in the Nazi ground-ups could not engage in the work of mourning. First of all, they hoped their parents would return. And since if you did return, why should their parents not be among them? There was this as long as there was this possibility, however slight, that one or both of their parents might still be alive, it was impossible for the children to mourn. It was impossible for the children to think and speak of them as if they were dead. Not to talk about them at all was the only way they had to prevent others from speaking of the missing parent. As and preventing them from doing so was the only way the children could continue to hang on to their hopes. This is why they refused to talk about it. But since they could not speak about their parents, not mention was the most important to them in life. So nothing they could talk about seemed important. Since they could deny the reality of their parents' disappearance, nothing could we talk about seems real. For something to be real to us, the reality needs to be validated by others. This why in the morning it's so important that we talk about the person who died to talk with it about persons who are close to us. It gives others a chance to convince us that the person has really died. Without talking about the death of a beloved person, his death remains to some degree unreal, and then we cannot really mourn it. Further, these children never received tangible and physical proof of the death of their parents. There was no body to be buried, no grave to be visited. There were no rituals which would have given the signal to begin the work of mourning, to organize it in its traditional ways, and thus have mourning to go on. Even given participation in all the normal rituals which help the living separate from the dead, the work of mourning must attend for long before it can be completed, certainly for many months and reduced form for years, over a lifetime. In some cultures where there's mourning gap for a month, in others for a year, it serves as a signal to everyone that one is in mourning. According to Jewish custom, <coughs> the gravestone is set only on the anniversary of the death or of the funeral. It marks the end of official period of mourning. The children of the Holocaust did not know the dates of the parents' deaths. Hence, they did not know when the period of mourning ought to have begun, nor when it should have ended. Without such clear dates for the beginning and ending of mourning, it seems to have no end. And there is a real chance that we have gained for the extent over all of the person's life. Frequently remarks that when people love deep one, 
Their presence anchors itself and survives in the memory of those who remain. Their recollection of daily conversation and the picture albums which one shows to one's children. From time to time one puts flowers on their graves and their names are there, engraved on the tombstone for all to see and read. But these children are robbed of any of the chance of sense. There are no gravestones to read, graves to be visited. One of the, Jean, one of the uh, persons called in, in Westview interviewed on this dilemma. Due to absence of tangible signs, which would testify to the life and death of his parents, it was impossible for him to forget about them. But it was also impossible to live a normal life. He said, and I quote, I often ask myself why I'm unable to talk, why I'm unable to take advantage of life. If I could completely forget the past, then I could possibly live as, like other people, happy with what I have, and I would not have to think all the time of what I have lost. I have no photos of my parents. I have no last letter from them, no grave to collect my thoughts on. All I have is a notice, disappeared, Auschwitz, 1943. It is terribly hard to continue to live. That was shared after the event. The absence of tangible proof does not permit a normal mourning to prevent an eternal grieving. Some remarks by Sonia make it clear that it is impossible to give up all hope and to free oneself of its consequence, which is to be always disappointed until the day when we receive some real proof. She told how she finally realized her parents had died with a book of Glasfeld, published in 78. There she found under the date of April 29, 1944, the names of her parents. It was a terrible shock to find this evidence, even 35 years after the event. All these years she had hoped, could not prevent herself from hoping, because without mourning, one cannot really believe that the loved person is dead. And without evidence of the death, one cannot mourn. Only after she read the proof of her parents death would she begin to mourn for them. Powerful as effects were which made it impossible for these children to mourn their parents, they wane into in insignificance when compared with the psych psychological conditions in which the children found themselves as soon as they were separated from their parents. In order to survive, these children could not permit, permit themselves to mourn, to fall into the depression, which is part of mourning. They needed all their mental energy to find ways to cope with life, to adapt themselves to a new way of life, to learn to live successfully with people they had not known before, in entirely new and strange conditions. There was nobody familiar around who could give them the loving support they would have needed to emotionally absorb what has happened to them. Claudine Rosengard, which was Claudine Weck's name at the time, had the rare luck to be taken in as substitute parents who loved their child, loved her as completely as she were their own child. They thus could offer quite favorable living conditions. Hers was exceptionally rare in lucky circumstances, even though she suffered. The stories of those who she interviewed show what the unimaginable difficulties these children had to overcome. So our people had to cope with, just to survive. The story of a Jewish boy not yet 10 years old at the time illustrates this. He was sent by his parents on a small errand. On his return to Annecy, where they living at this time in France, he saw the house in which he lived surrounded by the police. It was him, it let him guess what was going on. He immediately ran away into the open country and hid in a nearby forest. All he had with him was the address of a person who lived some 30 miles away. He did not dare to use a train out of fear of being discovered. During the day he hid in the forest and walked out on only during the night. Avoiding open roads. 
All he had to live on were the few provisions he had been sent out to buy. Eventually, it was possible for him to reach his address. But this person did not dare to keep him, because he feared for his own life. So he sent him on. The same thing happened to him twice more. Finally, the farmer hid him for a few days, and then placed him in a home for three or nine the children. There he was sick, until even the feeble-minded children became suspicious, because nobody ever visited for him and he received no letters, and he was different from them. So we can ask questions, which was the director who sent him to another children's institution, which fortunately within weeks of his arrival was liberated by Allied forces. This boy barely managed to survive, but survive he did. To be able to do so, he had to master all his mental and concentration, single-mindedly on survival. If he had given in to feelings caused by knowing that all his parents, well, family were deported, probably to be killed, he would not have had the strength to go on. He had to repress his feelings to be able to do what was necessary for survival. Because he did, he is now the only survivor of what was once a large family. I mentioned already that all rights of, of mourning have as an essential feature the support which family, friends, and the community provide the sufferers with. And that only this support permits the mourning to reintegrate themselves after their loss. I mentioned that all children who have lost their parents due to the other catastrophes, real as their sufferings, had been often managed to survive without having experienced terrible consequences. This leads me to my last point. Why it was so different for the Jewish children who lost their parents due to the Nazi Holocaust. Children who lose their parents to other catastrophes feel what the response of the world is to their suffering and how everybody tries to help them to survive and to respond to this positive reaction. They know that the rest of the world pities them, wishes them to come to their help, hopes that their fate will not destroy them. Since everybody seems happy that at least they were saved and seem to want to help them, this permits them, once the immediate threat of them, that their lives is over, to go begin the process of mourning, which is appropriate to their age of maturity. In addition, all efforts are made to find the corpses of their parents and to bury them with all their appropriate rights. All this helps these unfortunate children to accept the facts, to accept that they are irreversible, protect them from engaging in false hopes, and encourage them more and more. The psychological situation was exactly the opposite in the Nazi occupied countries. Two Claudine's new parents want to survive, did all they could to make it so possible. All the children who survived it were people who helped them to do so. Otherwise, none of them would have survived. And those who helped them to great risk for themselves and their families. But these attitudes, which provided these children with their sole opportunity to survive, did not change the fact that society at large the powers which control our life, the government was determined to destroy them. The very obligation should have been to protect them, protect their lives and the life of their parents. We are determined to destroy them. At first robbed them of their parents and then killed them. It was not due to unfortunate chance, to catastrophes that these children lost their parents. This is the case when parents die of an illness or a natural death. It was because their parents were Jewish, that they, would, they wanted to live, and the authorities had to die. So there's no way to escape the race into which one is born. This even quite a young child knows, at least to some degree. One cannot really weep for the loss of a parent when one knows is also fated to be killed. 
The despair and the refusal to feel are the only reactions which are psychologically possible. I found myself doing the years when they buckled in a somewhat similar situation. I was very sad when a comrade was murdered. But one did not shed tears because one was oneself only to help bright away from death. If one would have given in to the sadness, which is part of mourning, the risk would have much greater that one would not have been able to master the strength necessary for struggling for survival. I would have lost the resolution needed for struggling on for it. In such a situation, mourning becomes an obstacle, making survival possible or likely. Justine Wex speaks of an overwhelming feeling, the danger of permanent death. She mentioned it in a somewhat different context. I believe this feeling has its origin of what she felt when she had to hide herself, trembling with fear about being discovered, what she thought others felt when they hid themselves to escape being sent to the extermination camps. They knew that even though they were in hiding, and relatively secure for some time. There was no way to escape one's birth. This is why when asked one of the interviews about his origins, his answer was he was a Buchenwaldian. By refusing, by denying, whatever it may be that one denies, one alienates oneself from what is, what is denied. To apply the image Helen Epstein used, encloses his feelings in a box, in an iron box, which has no key, lost it carefully and with yet definitely. But despite all these efforts, one cannot get rid of what is in this, in this box. It remains something strange within oneself and has power over one's life. Claudine Weck continues her book by saying, we, the Jewish children who lived through the Nazi period, we all have rejected chains as something that is outside ourselves. But it doesn't work. We cannot put outside ourselves what it is in reality, the most important ideal of our lives. If we try to do this, then we detach ourselves from our very lives. We must accept those experiences as the most important aspect of our lives. The account is the book have shown that is exactly what has happened to the degree that we try to repress this, to that degree we stopped uh, living. We ended, we did end it to dominate our lives. To those who have participated in the creation of this book, it has become a significant step forward. It ended the attempt at repression and denial. It is the first start to begin warning, warning the murders of their parents so that in this way the memories are put to grave, so that finally the children come alive. Now my remarks centered on the lack of mourning rather than on the horror suffered by these who learn, we learn about in this and other books. The great courage and the much too heavy burden of their memories. I concentrated on the mourning because I believe that for them this morning has given meaning to the conversations with Claudine Weg. As she relates, they showed this by withdrawing more and more into themselves as they spoke of the great past and of the loss of their parents. They turned away from her. They immersed themselves ever more into the past, left the room, threw themselves on their beds, crying. As they themselves put it, the conversation was an endless monologue with ourselves. Nevertheless, they ended by saying all this out loud to a person who would listen to them with compassion. This is exactly what happens this morning. One speaks about what one has lost. In doing so, one talks mainly to oneself. But in the front of others, in the front of persons who are ready to share part of the world with us, who understand our sorrow, who wishes to help. It is this wish that gives us the courage, the strength to grieve, 
to really state of mourning and through mourning overcome experience. Now, so after that, I would like to say a little bit more about the Holocaust and the after effects. I think the First World War was really the Great Watershed. Only after the, since the First World War, with its millions of losses, purposeless losses, thank you, did mass extermination become possible. The first of them was that of the Armenians by the Turks. A direct consequence of the First World War. The next largest extermination was the starving to death of the Kulaks, millions of them, by Lenin and Stalin. Yeah. Uh, that is, genocide has happened since this First World War. Hitler was, after all, a consequence of the First World War. Without the First World War, Hitler would have never come to power. He was really paranoid, felt persecuted, which not does an excuse in any way what he did. But the effects of the Holocaust, I've experienced it in all my own children. We, their parents, tried with every effort to shield them from knowing about the Holocaust, shield them from knowing what we had suffered and of course we had been to death. But they felt a level of anxiety in our, their home. Although we never talked about it, the level of anxiety of my wife and mine was so high just from it. And as soon as they could, they left the home and moved as far away as they could. Although they loved us, they loved us, still loved us, but they couldn't bear to live with us because it would make life too difficult for them. This is a terrible consequence of the Holocaust. That's why I speak of the second and third generation. Children like my own who were raised in the security of the United States, who were born in the United States, raised in the security of the still felt something unmentionable that what Epstein calls the iron box with all the secrets hidden and the key lost. So that's why I'm afraid that it will go into the third generation because the level of anxiety that my own children experienced is transmitted to the level of anxiety they feel about their children. And that I've watched myself with misgivings, but I couldn't help it. So I'm afraid that the, firstly the Holocaust, or as I should say the First World War, and the aftermath demonstrated to men that it's possible that mass murder is possible. Now, Hitler's contribution was to organize it our paranoid ideas about eugenics, about the ideal race that he wanted to create, the superior Nordic race, the Aryan race he wanted to create. But the methods he used were the methods of modern science. Well, I have plenty of time to discuss what I tried to suggest to you. And if you have any questions, I'd be most happy to answer them. So we have a good half hour left. So. Whatever questions you want to raise, I'd be happy to try to answer them to the best of my ability. Yes. What would you say was the difference between what the Holocaust children suffered and what children of MIAs uh, experienced? It, I, I'm searching for the philosophy behind it. You touched for a minute on the fact that it was government that didn't protect them. That's right. Um, is there, I mean, they, they 
they still, I mean, MIA children can't bury their parents. Well, uh, what is your question, really? I ask you. My, my question is, do you see a difference in the constellation, in the psychological constellation? Well, I don't know. I, I think that we have to live with the fact that it has been demonstrated that mass examination is possible. It's a horrible fact, but we have to live with it. And I think we have to deepen our emotional ties to each other and our desire to live and to make this, hopefully, a, a better world. Difficult as it is to believe in it, that this is because of what we all experienced. The best hope is still for life is still life. And what I try to suggest, part of life is to mourn the death. And if we can't do that, it was not possible to to this examination of the Jews in Europe. This is what life them of a chance to live on. We must mourn, we must be able to mourn. And not say it's, it's over, all over with. The, the work of mourning still remains to be done. It's one man's opinion. Well, as I said, it needs some tangible evidence. That is very important. And uh, if possible, you know, if you can, someone has made memorial uh, states, uh, places in, uh, in, in Dachau and in Buchenwald and in Auschwitz. And I think maybe if those who left lost the parent in Auschwitz, shall we say, make a pilgrimage thing and put it to rest, that would be helpful. In general, I found the monuments to the memories of the victims not very impressive, but the only impressive really I saw is in the old news, old Alt Neu Synagogue in Prague, old news synagogue, the synagogue of the famous Rabbi Leuf. And there is a room devoted to the memory of uh, the Jews deported and killed of, of Czech origin. And all they have there is a, the names. The walls carry the names. And this was an idea that, as you know, was uh, copied in the Vietnam monument in Washington, which also is impressive. Just the names and nothing else. Now the Wat of Shame in Jerusalem is another story. And it also may, may help survivors to try to live with the fact that they are survivors. It is a difficult fact to live with the fact that one is a survivor. That's why I began my remarks by mentioning these great writers and poets who committed suicide because they couldn't live with the fact. But we have to try to live with it. We have to do some warning. Whether we lost some, somebody close to us or not, there's a lot of mourning to be done that needs to be done. Warning about those who were killed and who were prevented from warning. One of the uh, problems of the camps was you could not never mourn anybody who got killed. It would destroy your chance for survival, small as it was. Certainly, the Nazi wouldn't permit any morning. 
but even if on route one, as those who mourned, as likely as not lost their lives. So mourning was not possible because it is the opposite. Mourning has a purpose to make it possible for us to go on living, a purpose to destroy us. Yes, please. What advice would you have for the second and third generation to improve the interrelationship of the family? Well, I think it's understandable when it's just a survivor that one doesn't want to talk about it. One doesn't want to burden one's children. On the other hand, in answer to your question, I still believe the best way to do it is to talk openly, frequently and openly about it. When the children want to hear. If they don't want to hear, don't bother them with it. But if they want to hear and they're interested, then talk with them openly and freely. And don't make the mistake I and my wife made trying to shield them from it. I would like to survive It's certainly one way to cope with it. Uh, the other hand, uh, you know, in order to believe in the power of prayer, you have to be a deeply religious person. And not all survivors are deeply religious. What about crying, raging, screaming, and wailing? <laughs> Well, that's my response to it. Yeah, well, I, I don't think that helps. You don't think it helps? None of the emotion, the expressions? Crying is all right. Mm -hmm. Raging. You see, these are emotions which are commensurate to the human dimension. They're what? They commensurate to the human mm -hmm. dimension, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's to rage against the fate of a whole people. Very difficult. But at least to express it. Yes, yeah. I'm all in favor that we express it. But raging, you know, is, is I, I believe, is not a constructive way to deal with it. I think we all, every one of us has to find what he considers a constructive way. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just speak up. Yes. What can we as a society... Make pardon? I said, what can we... Stand up, please. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming to us. I wanted to ask what we as a society do to prevent this from happening to any particular ethnic group in the future? Well, I think we all do what we can. Uh, although, as you know, there was uh, the latest uh, mass murder was in Cambodia. Uh, there was the latest mass murder. And there was very little we really could do about it. Yes? Um, do you think that there's a relationship between the Israel, the Israel nation's treatment of the Palestinians? Do you think that there's a relationship between Israel's uh, treatment of the Palestinian camps and their desire for homeland and being survivors of the Holocaust? Well, that's a difficult question, as you know, we all hope. We <laughs> hope that some adjustment would be found between the Jews in Israel and the Palestinians. What I wonder about is if the repression of, if not having been able to give it an outlet for their mourning and rage, 
if possibly unconsciously it comes out in the response to the Palestinian as a shadow race? Well, I, I think that uh, without the Holocaust, firstly, we don't know whether there would be a state of Israel. Because it was very largely the uh, European immigrants who created the state of Israel. And there, there is the, what happens in Palestine, what was Palestine, it's not Israel, it cannot be comprehended without the level of anxiety that, you know, out of a desire, it shouldn't happen again. Maybe some intransigency, some resistance to any peace settlement can be explained. I think we, what the American press and the most Americans don't understand is the level of anxiety due to the Holocaust which doesn't excuse it, but explains it. Yeah, please, don't wait for me, just talk. <laughs> I, I don't know whether forgive is the right word, but do you think at a level, and I guess also um, for, for people in your position, is it possible to ever forgive the German people for what they did? Is it possible but, to ever come to a kind uh, of feeling things, of, of... I don't think uh, things people. are done by people. Things are done by individuals. And most Germans who now live are born, we are born, we are children under Hitler, or we are born after time. That's also, there are still some of the perpetrators around, as we all know, uh, but it has been a long time, you know. It's how many years has it been since 45? Over 40 years. So I, I don't believe in a collective guilt, <coughs> nor do I believe in negotiations. I believe only in individual guilt. If they are, I'm not ready to forgive some individual who deliberately destroyed other people. But I don't believe in guilt by associations. And I think when we talk about the Germans, people that we do make exactly the, commit the crime Hitler did. I say to be a Jew is worse to be destroyed without disregard of personal values or exceptions. So I, this, that's why I don't believe that we, it, it makes any sense to claim that all Germans are guilty. As a matter of fact, I just read a short time ago that of a, a German Gentile girl who grew up during the Nazi period, and how difficult it was to be anti-Nazi in Germany. She was part of the White Rose movement of students, and uh, she describes, you know, her own feelings as a growing girl, where uh, both her parents were anti-Nazis, but not active. She became active in the White Rose and survived it, fortunately. Mm. So, you see, it's, they, are, they are good Germans, you know. <laughs> you spoke of the pain of being Jewish, and you spoke of the pain of shielding your children from the truth, from the experience that you had. But it seems that those parents who shared their experiences with the children, there was still pain, because the children still couldn't accept your parents one cannot share pain. experiences, yeah. you know. One cannot try to understand them, but one cannot share it. Uh, I think that what I and my wife did was purely automatic. 
without a conscious decision. We just didn't want to talk about it. But, but you say your children had a response to that. That's right. And I'm saying that it's a level of anxiety. Yeah, but the, those children whose parents did talk about it have a level of anxiety. Exactly. That's why I say it will take at least three generations to overcome it, maybe more. But I don't think there's much hope to find a solution for the second generation that's viable for all of them. That's why I talk so much about mourning, because the task of mourning, say only through mourning can one really make one's peace with the death of a beloved person. And how does one mourn six million people? I don't know. Yes, please. Um, we talked about uh, men who were able to get out. They can? Older people who were in, in the concentration camps, locking their feet away in a, in a deep iron box and throwing away the key or not having access to the food. Um, do you believe that the men who had liberated the concentration camps came in kind of feeling? Uh, my father in 1945 liberated Gierfeld Gierfe yeah. And uh, he is a devout Catholic. He brought it back to California with him. A very proud man, but a uh, tremendous alcoholic. It destroyed him on the inside. Um, in the book that we're studying in this course, uh, Mr. Abzug's book deals with the, the coming of conflicts between these two people, between the Holocaust survivors and the men who had liberated believe that there is some kind of common bond because uh, my father indeed is, is exactly the way that you, you relate it. He, he locked it away. He can't talk about it. Well, I don't, I, I'm not amazed. I'm not astonished that he doesn't want to talk about it. When you were talking about the shame and the guilt, you know, I'll give that child, you know, not saying goodbye to it. We're thinking that, you know, how about a child, you know, he's probably angry at his parents because his parents are leaving him, you know, and angry because, you know, he doesn't understand everything that's going on, and all this anger and guilt, and then later when he finds out that there was really nothing that his parents could do, that they were just basically dragged away, and that they had no say so in it anyway, I think some of that guilt is from that anger that you probably felt, and, and, and not Well, I agreed to come here, although I'm very old, and traveling isn't easy, because I think it's very important that the events of the Holocaust are brought to the attention of the new generation who didn't live through this period. And I wanted to do my share, small as it is, to keep this problem in front of our eyes. It won't go away by not wanting to talk about it.
children's children, and that we take action when we see um, a group being oppressed so that it doesn't get hidden under the table where, where we deny that it's going on. And that I think that's, that's the way to prevent this from happening again. And I have a question for you on, it ties in with the memory and the mourning. And um, recently, well in the last few years, I've been confronted with the question of, of um, you Jews, you just need to let die already. You're beating a dead horse. You come. Be, you're, um, you're keeping the memory of the Holocaust alive, and when are you just going to go on with your life? Well, Maybe to keep the memory alive is going on with one's life. Isn't that possible? I think that I think that you are right to want to share as much as possible the experiences of your parents. And the best thing people can do is to talk about, talk with each other about it. That was really the main idea I wanted to present to you. These people, this, that Claudine Devec and Helen Epstein interviewed for the first time we were able to talk about it. And they felt better when they could open up about their feelings and talk about it. You know, I, I'm a psychoanalyst, so we believe in the talking cure. <laughs> I think when with your father, you will help him talk with you about it. You might be reluctant because I know as a father, I was, didn't want to burden my children, you know. Uh, and to create guilt feelings in them. So I think that is, I firmly believe <coughs> That the best way is to talk with each other in a serious way about these things. They will not go away by not talking. That's my main point. Sometimes I feel like he's waiting to die. But come? Sometimes it feels like he's waiting to die, so he won't have to. Excuse me, can I speak to this? Because um, my father was involved in the liberation of several internment camps. Well, it's difficult, you know. And after all, what I try to present to you is difficult for you and difficult for me. But as I believe, firmly believe that the only way by talking about it will we be able to master it, not to forget, forget it, not to deny it, but to master it. Experience of the 
Well, uh, I think Helen Epstein, whom I quoted, and Claudine Levesque, and Saul Friedländer, who is a professor of Holocaust studies at the University of California in Los Angeles, spent between the University of Tel Aviv, half year and half year in Los Angeles, uh, and that there are centers for Holocaust studies now at various places, what? Yeah, it's, it's, you can't sit, it won't do to say, now, today we are going to have a good talk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does work this way. my son about it, because he wanted to talk about it. And it was a relief for him and a relief for me. Experiment. You know about the, you know about the Milgram experiment. No. Well. Uh, oh, the Milgram experiment. Yeah. 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 So that shows that uh, people is very easily to get people to commit atrocities if it's supposedly for a good purpose and uh, with the approval of the authorities, which is a sad reflection on human beings. On the other hand, I'm, I'm personally convinced there would be many people who would not participate in such an experiment. It's wrong to, to include for me, to conclude for me that anybody will do it in all circumstances. I don't believe so. Well, <laughs> uh, the book of Authority and Personality, you know, I was a co-author of another book in this series. It was a series of studies sponsored by the American Jewish Committee. And uh, Adorno and Horkheimer came up with this idea of the Authority and Personality. But I personally don't think it's a very good book. <laughs> <laughs> well, excuse me. I can tell you, part of reservation is 
Professor Janowitz and I published a book, The Dynamics of Prejudice, where I tried to analyze prejudice and at the same time make suggestions what can be done about it. Uh, our time on Adorno study does, does give no answer what can be done about the personality. Dr. Bader, I, uh, I saw your Well, I, I, yeah. At the same time, they uh, give uh, voice to all the great accomplishments of uh, of Germany and so forth. Don't you think uh, there's a lack of balance by not? Well, a lack of there might very well be a lack of balance. I'm not familiar enough with all the details to know whether there's a lack of balance or not. But in general, I personally felt that. Most Germans I had direct contact with uh, suffered from the consequences in some way or other. Uh, their relationship to their Nazi parents is a very difficult one for the present generation of Germans. Uh, they find it very difficult to make peace with it. But contrary to the Austrians, whom I know better, they don't deny it to the degree the Austrians, to the degree the Austrians deny it. So I think there is a uh, sadness, I should say, I wouldn't say guilt, but certain sadness among many Germans. The Germans have did that. Absolutely true, <laughs> but where you want to get involved, I think that's a personal decision. What you want to get involved, I think <coughs> most people feel better when they get themselves involved. Well, uh, the depersonalization of what of, which is part of modern science uh, worries me. I think that when the computer will decide, the computers will decide, people will not have a personal response. Uh, the best thing is still to retain your personal involvement, as has been suggested from various people here. Uh, if we let the machines do it, we are creating new dangers. The depersonalization, particularly depersonalization is human relations. Of course, the mass media, <coughs> you know, murder and, and uh, incest sells papers.
I, I don't think that very young children should be bothered with the Holocaust, if you ask me. Uh, uh, this is a problem that can be raised with adolescents, but not before. It should not be raised before adolescents, because it then only creates anxiety and discomfort without any problems. Don't you kind of feel, um, in response to that, I've listened to people talk, and, and when very small children are told about the threat of nuclear war, and that's a form of genocide in itself we have hanging over our heads all the time, they have the Again, I said we shouldn't talk, we shouldn't bother children. They cannot do anything about it, you know? You only scare them out of their wits. I think one shouldn't bother only people when they are reaching, where they can do something about it. What can a child do about nuclear war or the environment? I think they, they should grow up in peace and security till they reach the age of maturity, which is certainly not before adolescence. Do you see a connection between... I beg your pardon? Yeah. Do you see a connection between the denial of their responsibility as well as the denial, at least of Germany, that they were ever part of the Reich, and the fact that uh, Kurt Waldheim happens to be the president of Austria today? Well, I think Waldheim is president of Austria for a wide variety of reasons. But the most important is that compared to what Waldheim done, most Austrians have done minor things. So if you can become president, also you have bigger perpetrator crimes that kind of excuses your smaller crimes. <laughs> it's a psychological explanation, but I think it's valid. Yes, I, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, <clears throat> some survivors are very willing to talk about their experience but they don't find very frequently listeners. Because in my experience, I found that not too many people are interested in the stories or the uh, ability to say something about the Holocaust uh, and uh, uh, relate to it because it's threatening. That's right. And I think that therefore it has to be done in small doses. You know? The difference is that... Uh, Homeopathic doses. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Otherwise, it's too massive and only creates helplessness. So one must not open the sluice gates all at once. It's a slow process. To work, through, to work things through is a slow process. It takes time and effort. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to find the, what the consciousness of students is on this campus in regards to that event. And some of your comments might be in regards to what we got to Nazis marching right here in Napa. Well, unfortunately, in every society, there is a percentage of nuts. Where you want to put the percentage is one sigma uh, of, uh, or two sigmas, depends on you. Yeah, but I think that in any large number of people, you will find some 5% who are, don't fall out of the normal distribution. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. You overwhelmed me. Thank you very much. You embarrassed me. I did a poor job, I know it. Thank you very much.
We thank you very much for your very stimulating and inspiring presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming, for listening to me. Sure. I met you before. I'm Susan Bettelheim. You had I mean, met at your son Eric's. That's right. family together, and I'm glad you came here, and you were really quite well, marvelous thank you very today, much. and I'm glad to get to see you again. Thank you. It was really quite wonderful. So. Thank you very much. I want to thank you very much. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, I thank you. I thank you. Thank you. I look forward to researching your work and reading some of your books that you've read. Yeah. That you wrote. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Dr. Bethlehem, how yeah. do you do? Are My you? name is Schwarzbart. Freut mich sehr. When, when freut mich auch sehr. Ich bin Österreicher, ich bin geborener Wiener. Wann waren Sie in Buchenwald? 38-39. Mein Vater ist leider 45 in Buchenwald gestorben. Ah, ja, das ist schrecklich. Und, ja, na, ich frage immer, weil vielleicht hat ihn jemand gekannt, verstehen Sie? Ja. Dann frage ich immer und man sagt mir leider immer, nein, Fritz Schwarz hat es nicht gekannt. Schauen Sie, es waren ja viele. Ich weiß, ich verstehe das. Ja. Fünf Jahre lang. Na, auf Wiedersehen, Herr Doktor. Auf Wiedersehen. Dr. Bettelheim, have a, this mic is on you still. You may not be able to. Oh, that's right.